hi everybody and welcome back to 20 days of healing this week is all about green commitment and these are all of the little things that you can do at home or you can change in your life that can make a real difference to the world around you so my name is Vicky Poole and I'm joined today by Kelly hi Kelly hi <laughs> So I met Kelly through a Facebook page that I manage called Sustainable Burfield, which is how you can be more sustainable in and around the village where we're at, which is Burfield. Now, Kelly is a wildlife warden. So what's a wildlife warden, Kelly? So, um, yeah, I'm a wildlife warden. I work on nature reserves doing everything to try and make them better, better habitats for wildlife. So that's everything from counting the, the birds and butterflies doing the sort of ecological surveying side of things to the practical stuff. So hedge laying, mm -hmm. coppicing, um, dealing with the livestock and then sort of community stuff. So events and taking kids out to see it all and hopefully inspiring the next generation. So. Wow, and I hear the inspiring the next generation and that sounds awesome. What do the kids most enjoy about being out with you? I think they just love the fact that they're outside and they're moving around and they're learning while being there and, you know, sort of getting involved and, you know, even the naughtiest kids, they, they, they love it. They engage a lot better because they're not looking, I think, at like a presentation or watching a video. They're out there and, you know, they're lifting up logs, looking for insects and sort of running around, putting their arms around trees to see how long, you know, how big the tree is and things like that. So I think... Oh, yeah, I think it's just the general being outside and they don't really realise that they're learning by doing that, which is pretty cool. Here is the tree hugging and I'm so glad that that's coming back. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I know that we live quite close to each other, Kelly, mm. and I, I know that I catch myself doing some things as well, but I wonder from your perspective, who's someone who eats, sleeps and breathes sustainability and wildlife and trying to save the world, what do you see your neighbours doing that make you go, oh, oh, if actually you knew, you so wouldn't do that? Yeah, so it's normally things like weed, you know, spraying weed killer um, between the cracks in the patio or putting out slug pellets, things like that. You know, they're things that affect um, insects and you know so with the slug pellets for example people they just don't realize they think they're just killing off the slugs that are eating their veg or their flowers or whatever um but actually obviously has a much bigger effect so it's the animals that eat the slugs and snails that, that eat the slug pellets that are then poisoned and affected too so all your you know birds small mammals your hedgehogs um you know it's oh yeah it's just yeah, I, hate I didn't that. know that hedgehogs ate, um, ate slugs. I'm going to be attracting a whole yeah. load more hedgehogs into my garden. <laughs> That's what I can say. Yeah. That's it, you know. And, and there's so many other methods you can use. So, you know, things like crushing your eggshells, um, I think coffee grounds as well. You know, I think a lot of them are, you, you know, you maybe have to do it more often than you would put slug pellets down. But for me, that's it's worth it to not kill things that, you know, you weren't targeting in the first place. Um, I hear that. That's cool. Wonderful. So what about anything else that you can think of that you see people doing regularly? So uh, cutting the lawn every other day within an inch of its life throughout the spring and summer, that just that drives me mad. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Is that something called no, no, mo, may? Did I get that yeah. right? Yeah, so No Mo May was an initiative um, sort of promoted by Plant Life, which are one, is one of the leading plant conservation um, organisations in the UK. And they basically wanted to try and encourage people to not mow their lawns for the whole of, whole of May. Um, because, yeah, after that, you know, that whole four weeks of sort of early flowering things um, is really good for all the, all the insects and the bees, uh, the, you know, everything that comes out a bit earlier than later on when everything else is in bloom. Um, you sort of your daisies, your buttercups in the in the lawn. Um, and also having the grass a bit longer is habitat for all your insects and even, yeah, maybe your small mammals as well. But yeah, it's quite a, a nice initiative because it means you don't 
have to do anything and actually your lawn isn't going to go that out of control in a month that early on so yeah it's quite a so, nice so one, we're think. attracting lazy gardeners here is that that's what i'm trying to, yeah. to hear from you yeah, yeah awesome. and if by doing less you can get more insects and butterflies and bees and, and therefore birds and things by the end of it i think that's that's a pretty good thing <laughs> hearing a really startling um, percentage and that was like 97% of hedgehogs have gone since the 1960s as a population decline and I thought that was quite shocking and it, it forced me to look at some of the other stats that are around there mm -hmm. and I, I actually responded to a, um, a book a books books and Oxford Wildlife Trust post about the decline in sparrows and I, I took a photograph of three feeders that I have in the garden. And then I took a photograph at the same time, like rapid shot, of a, um, a climbing rose bush that had got um, green fly in it. And mm -hmm. I couldn't count the amount of sparrows that were in there. And they were like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, there are so many bird species that are declining. And I, I wondered if you had any sort of insight as to why those birds are declining um, or what maybe we could do to, to try and help? Sure, so I mean, I think the main thing for, um, the main thing, the main reason for uh, birds declining in, in the UK and, and around the world is, you know, um, habitat um, decline. So if you haven't got anywhere for these things to live, then, um, sorry, the dog. <sighs> Um, yeah, if they haven't got anywhere for these things to live um, and eat, then they can't survive, they can't reproduce, and their numbers obviously go down. So, um, yeah, what well, one thing that is really good to do in your garden that a lot of people do, especially through lockdown, I think it's kept a lot of people uh, quite sane, is, you know, feeding the birds, leaving out water for them, um, and like you say, leaving habitat for them so this is why you know you try and encourage people not to cut their hedges and their trees and their bushes you know through the spring and summer months because you're then cutting down their habitat and um yeah we don't want to be doing that <laughs> so. and i also hear you saying that it's it's not just about habitat loss it's about the the food and birds most birds eat insects right insects and, and seeds yeah yeah mostly and what did chicks eat? So obviously birds lay eggs, eggs hatch into chicks, you know, can the chicks eat the same food as all the adults or do they have a special diet? So they'll mostly be fed caterpillars. So in the, it depends on the species, of course, but, you know, your most common birds like your tits and things like that, they will be, their parents will bring them caterpillars um, all through the spring. This is why, you know, everything comes out, has babies at the same time because the, the insect population will support the, the bird population um so yeah it's uh mo mostly caterpillars because that will provide them with food and fluids because baby birds can't go out and drink like their parents can um you know they rely on their food source to get their um water intake interesting i didn't know that uh, that's really cool so then so then the question then becomes, I, I'm just saying this formulating in my head now, is that if you've got a decrease in insect population, a decrease in, um, in butterflies and moths that, you know, become caterpillar eggs and that becomes caterpillars, if all that population's declining, what are the baby birds eating? Exactly. That's the problem. That's why, you know, getting out your pesticides is, is the worst thing you can do and, and you know getting rid of the, the weeds and the plants the the all of you know the native species that all of our native so the native plant species that all of our native insects rely on um you don't want to be getting rid of those because you know they lay their eggs on them they are very often specific so um things like nettles for example people have this thing against nettles and yeah you don't want your whole garden to be nettles but you could leave a patch of them because some of our favorite butterfly species they lay their eggs on them and then their larvae so their caterpillars rely on that food plant for them so um i, look, I looked it up you know with the nettles which which species like that and it's 
it's quite a few. So it's comma, painted lady, peacock, red admiral, and small tortoise shell. So quite a lot of those are butterflies that you know we're quite used to seeing. And if you think if if we all just had a you know a little bit extra nettles or something in the garden, you might see even more. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's remembering that you know the plants, the insects rely on the plants, and then the birds, the mammals rely on insects. Um, and you need to have this sort of whole sort of little ecosystem going on for it to all work. Interesting. So there's a lot there about actually not sculpting your garden and actually just letting some wildlife take over, let nature take over. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to let it become a complete jungle for it to be good to good for wildlife at all. Um, you know, things like just leaving like a, you could, if you've got a big enough garden, you could just leave a messy corner where, you know, you don't sort of cut anything, you let, you let sort of maybe thistles and nettles come up there. Um, simple things like just doing, um, like a log pile or you know all the bits you cut when you're trimming other bits of the garden pile them up there um you know that'll be good habitat for for someone um mostly sort of insects that break down um you know the rotting wood um you can um do what we call um well we call them organ pipes where you you know if you've cut down something that's a bit bigger you can put the logs upright and bury them a little bit into the ground which here in the Thames Valley is really a really easy way to get um, to get um, stag beetles which are a really rare species so yeah it's might not look the tidiest but you'll see the effects of you know increased insects and you might not even notice that many more unless you look properly but you will notice more birds you might notice that hedgehog move in you know things like that. Well, I think this is I think what we're talking around here is you know activities that parents can do at home with their kids. Oh yeah definitely. Yeah. Loving definitely. it. Loving it. I do want to go back to just the the birds for a minute um, uh -huh. because you know I hadn't realized that you know just by by spraying a few sprays and killing some insects was actually having that that kind of impact going up the chain. So then mm -hmm. if you were gonna put out food to help the mum and like the mum and dad birds throughout the year, what can you put out to help the baby birds? So it's really good to put out um, mealworms or waxworms. Um, so mealworms are the sort of cheaper version and they're a native beetle species. So you don't have to worry if some- Say yeah. again. Live. Live, yeah, live is better. So, um, you can buy them dried and if you do this it's um sort of the the advice is to soak them for at least half an hour into water so that they can reabsorb some of the liquid which is you know for what we were talking about earlier with the baby birds not being able to drink and they rely on um the liquid from their sort of caterpillar food source so yeah live is live is better because you get twice as much protein fat and fiber and 12 times as much water as you do in a dried wheel mealworm. Um, so, okay. but I know handling live break. things isn't for everybody. Um, so if you get dried ones, soak them first and then put them out. Um, and we're thinking timing wise, sort of in the spring, as soon as you see um, the birds sort of starting to nest, things like that, you might be thinking, oh, we'll get some mealworms in and, and uh, we'll see, yeah, see if you can sort of, I'm sensing here again another project for kids to get involved with at home. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, kids, and kids aren't as worried about creepy craw crawlies as we are. And if they are, it's normally because we've sort of taught them to be. So, even if you don't want to touch them, you know, a kid will grab a handful of mealworms and put them out for the birds. Easy. So, and when you're feeding birds like white um, like live food, do they need? To, do, can they just just go on the ground? Will the finders by having yeah, it there? Could. Are we going to attract anything else, like anything that we don't want in the in the in the garden, like rats or mice? I don't think so. I mean, mice and voles might come and and try and try and take them because they're sort of opportunistic. But generally, you'll you'll see the birds are out looking to feed their you know their babies. Like some of them need something like eighty five caterpillars a day. 
so and and that and then they have like five or six chicks or sometimes more so they are on the lookout for you know caterpillars so yeah you probably won't find that they hang around for long I tend to put them in sort of a dish on um either on the ground or we've got sort of a little platform feeder thing so we we tend to put them on there and you can step back and as soon as the birds have cracked that there's some there they won't forget they'll come back every day and expect there to be more um so I like that expect there to be more it's a bit like <laughs> having cats isn't it yeah yeah cats That's don't true. have owners they have servants birds no, take it to exactly. a whole new level okay and and while we're talking about baby birds it's a really good idea not to feed whole peanuts um during the nesting season because obviously the firstly they're very dry so obviously they're not you know don't want to fill the birds up the babies up on dry seeds um but also they're quite big and they can get lodged and the baby birds can choke so we you, yeah you can i don't know grate them or you can cut them up into little bits or just avoid them and put your mixed seeds out i wouldn't yeah i wouldn't risk whole peanuts um through the spring and summer just just in case i mean it's okay if you put them in a in a I don't know you know those feeders that have got proper fine mesh and the birds have to peck them out that that would be okay but certainly not sort of looser so that they can take a whole peanut away that's really useful insight thank you for sharing that Lily. Yeah. i know that you're really really passionate about a whole lot of other things as well mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if there's anything in particular that you think people could do at home yeah so I mean, some of the things we've already spoken about, like feeding the birds, having a, a messy corner. Um, yeah, all those things are great. The best thing for wildlife that you can, you know, you can do in your garden, if you haven't already got one, is to, another, again, another thing you can do with your kids is to put in um, a pond or something. It hasn't got to be big. So I haven't got a very big garden and we've got, we, I've got an old butler sink of Facebook mar marketplace for about 20 quid. And we dug that in and yeah if you think you're adding a whole habitat that isn't there already so you're going to get different insects obviously different um things living in the pond but also it's a water source for everything from mammals to birds everything's going to come along and you know you can put some plants in there and always make sure there's a sort of exit route so if anything falls in like a hedgehog or something or a mouse whatever even your to toads your frogs um, you need to have sort of a gradient or put some rocks in it or something so that they can get out otherwise yeah it might have the opposite effect as you you know from what you intended <laughs> that was a good idea I like that fantastic cool and I wonder if there's, if there's anything else that you've got Kelly or should we start to wrap this up um um i think the main thing i think is to try and get to know what's in your garden too you know if you can see a lot of people sort of they don't look they see without is it look without seeing or see without looking i can't remember the phrase look without seeing is the phrase isn't it you know you sort of got the hustle and bustle of life and you don't always notice what's there i mean it's the big garden bird watch this weekend which is sort of i think it's the rspb encouraging people to count what's in their garden sort of a citizen survey um so sort of notice what you've got and think oh what what could be missing you know it's lovely that you've got that robin coming every day but but you know is there are there other birds that might benefit and you can then you can you know you can look up online what different seeds will attract different birds things like that um and again i think my other main thing is obviously we all well, most of us love our gardens and love planting beautiful flowers from all over the world, which is great. And most of the time when you go to garden centres, it will have they'll have a little tag that says great for bees or butterflies on it or pollinators. And that's great. But it'd be really good, I think, if more people could try and focus on more sort of native species rather than these amazing tropical ones, because although they'll both supply nectar to bees and butterflies, it goes back to what I was saying before about having that what we call the host plant that has co-evolved along our alongside our native species of insects. Um, 
so that then you're getting somewhere for things to lay their eggs and then something for their um their sort of caterpillars and things to eat and therefore increasing the amount of butterflies and things that you're going to get not just keeping the adult alive with nectar from yeah whatever plants you decide to buy that's kind of something that that is really obvious but it's not you know to everyone to me that's obvious but I know to most people it's not and you, you know the garden centers obviously want to sell as many as you know as much of whatever as they can but yeah it's always a good idea to think native if we can at risk of sounding um what's the word xenophobic not at all not xenophobic of plants but yeah I, I hear that and it's the we, we've evolved to live here where we are our animals have a lot have evolved to live here where they are too and if we're going to share this part of the world together wherever it is where we are whether it's England France or Germany South America the animal species have evolved to live on the plants that were there not what we choose to put there that's exactly it yeah so it's just a small difference you can make you know if you're going to buy 10 plants and you think okay well I'll make sure half of them are native then great you know Well, of this conversation we're going to have a whole load of people going into the woods and bringing home nettles <laughs> yeah luckily yeah they they're pretty easy to uh in encourage aren't they it's they're not they're not a, a difficult species to get back so yeah and you can make nettle tea from them which is i think really good for your kidneys so i'll have to look that up and put it in the comments so that people know that they can make nettle tea although i have seen it that you can actually use it as a surround for cheese as well oh, there's a kind of cheese in cornwall that's covered in nettles doesn't surprise me <laughs> and actually one of my volunteers has made rope from he's like weaves the nettle stems together and he's made like rope from it which who knew <laughs> So many things you can do for nettles. I do yeah. do using nettles. So get them in your garden. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Kelly, it's been absolutely fantastic chatting with you today. Um, thank you very much for all of your insights. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everybody for watching who's tuning in on replay. Um, my name's Vicky Poole. If you like what you see, you can click the subscribe button below and you can catch everything else that comes out this week. Um, you can catch myself and what I'm doing and talking about as a coach at Vicky Pool Coach on Twitter and Instagram. And you can also join um, my coaching um, Facebook group, which is Flourishing Together. Although for this week, you might find it more interesting to join and follow the page Sustainable Burfield, which is where Kelly and I share a lot of our sustainability and life-saving tips. So thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. Take care and God bless. Bye now. <laughs>